<laughs> Button yeah. it all the way up. Oh, is that all? <laughs> yeah, it's it's all the way up, baby. All right, we are going to get this started right about. <laughs> What is up, everybody? Welcome to Comic Book Club. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are coming to you live from a couple of places on the internet. We are live on Crowdcast. We're live on YouTube. You might be listening later on the old podcast tutoriums that are online. Could be Apple Podcast Tutorium, Spotify Podcast Tutorium. This is a real word. Lay off me, you guys, okay? Yeah. Uh, uh, every, listen. The comments are lighting up with people being like, hey, like that's not what it's called. <laughs> but we have a great packed show for you tonight. But before uh, we get into it, we should probably all our talk about are back tonight. all our favorites are back. As we talk about every week, though, Brett Macris, Stray Bullet. Stray Bullet. C- yes. Okay. Should I just pause there for you to say that, Pete? That make you, or do you like the interrupting? I do like the interrupt. What do you now. think? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I could have answered that question. Yeah. So he has been curating a different drink for us every week. Sometimes it's been from the Gotham City cocktail book. Sometimes it's just been from uh, fan favorites, from the Patreon Slack, from his brain, from the internet, wherever. But this time, this guy's a chef. very exciting. He's, he's an actual chef. Yeah. He designed a drink for the show this time. Out. Ooh, gonna, ooh, ooh. Yeah, which is very he's cool. A bar chef. Yes. So here, I'm going to bring up the recipe here on the live oh, video cast. So it's called the Behold the Vision. I have to assume it is, well, partially it's with ingredients that we've all bought over the past couple of months to make these cocktails, yes. but also to tie into Doctor Strange 2 is coming out. I don't know if Vision is in it, but Scarlet Witch is, and she went through some stuff with WandaVision, so it makes sense. But yeah. if you're listening, this is uh, Mezcal, St. Germain, Campari, Dry White Vermouth or Vermouth Blanc, and use three dashes of Pink House Alchemy Smoldered Bitters, which are... Hot phenomenal they're these amazing spicy bitters they're so good and uh, muddled basil leaves and the instructions is after you put everything together you sip and wonder if your life is real your kids are real and if wanda can really just make people up wow so great nice. recipe that's what well i do done. at a bar anytime it's true. Um, exactly. that drink looks amazing i didn't have any mezcal so um I could oh make them, man but, um, I, I guarantee you i will buy these ingredients and make this bev within the week my wife's going out of town for six weeks, and I'm going to be solo parenting. Um, and you're going to see me. I think did I say this last week? You're going to see me literally fall apart over the course of the next. Uh, that's going to be fun. That's well, if you have this drink, you'll feel a lot better. I did make it because I did have the ingredients around. It's great. It's like, you know, you got a little bit of the smoke going on. It tastes a little bit like the Negroni. Um, it's lighter. You got the basil on the back. Really good stuff. You got the basil Thank on you, the Brett. back, says Alex. Stop. Okay. For those Please. listening, I'm doing the coolest moves you've ever seen. Oh if you're only God. listening to the audio podcast. Furious. <laughs> yeah, it was really amazing. It was like something out of Step Up to the Streets. Yeah, you used to really be into devil sticks, right, Alex? Really big into the devil sticks uh, situation. People would come by uh, Union Square Park to see me do that. <laughs> Okay, cool. Are you an alien? Union he Square lives Park. in New York? Yeah. I don't know. I suddenly panicked and couldn't think of any Union parks. Union Square Park. <laughs> you live in New York. Yeah. I was like, I can't say Central Park. I can't say Central Park. Let me uh, come up with literally. Oh, no, I can't think of any parks right now. Oh, okay. Where am I? Oh, I'm hanging out at The Bean <laughs> in Chicago. <laughs> it's a park. Come find me Please. on the Golden Gate Bridge here in San Francisco. Who are you lying to? Who are you trying to convince, Alex? Where are you? Alex, Do you know who I'm, I'm trying to we're... convince? I'm trying to convince our first guests here on the show. They are the creator of a new book called The Panic, which is out, I believe, today from Comixology. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Clyde and Andrea oh, oh, Moody. Hello, this. Neil. Yeah. Good to see Neil you. With Always the, good to see you. What a flex backdrop you have behind uh, you. His own personal <laughs> arcade back there. So last time I had one, and this time I have to show. Oh, here you go. One. So every time there's going to be a new machine. All right. Oh, that is awesome. And Andrea, welcome. Where are your arcade machines? I don't see any. Thank machines. you so much. No arcade to me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you sent them here. You sent them here. So. Yeah. yeah, of course. 
Uh, so let's talk about the panic. This book is pretty uh, terrifying, as you can tell from the title. But nightmare the scenario. rough <laughs> nightmares, yeah. like literal nightmare scenario. I know I was joking about not knowing anything about New York, but the rough idea of the book is there's this train crash or explosion or something happens. There's still some mysteries about that. Uh, people are trapped. And then we follow different timelines after that and also during that. And it legitimately is like, uh, one of my number one New York nightmares. Yeah. Uh, Neil, I know you talk about it in the back matter a little bit, but where did this idea come from? Um, so before I dig into that, I just like to point out that all five of us have beards, and I think that's amazing. So, <laughs> yeah, life, you know what I mean? Once you go beard, it's hard to go back to the old um, aging baby face. I agree. <laughs> um, yeah. So where did this come from? So it came from a couple of different places. So, I mean, I, like many people that we know, uh, was living in Manhattan around 9-11. And after the truck towers fell, um, there was a lot of, I mean, the city was shut down. The city was sort of locked down for those of us who were, who were in the city. And there was a lot of this, like, wandering around, wondering what to do, everyone just kind of reacting to this just tragedy that happened. And I was hearing stories of people that had been trapped in the subways, like as the towers were falling, not knowing what was going on, just being told by the dispatcher or whoever you know, the drivers were, um, that something was happening and they were delayed and they found out later. And so for me, that was kind of the impetus, this kind of what happens if you're in the middle of something, um, a disaster, a tragedy, and you don't know what it is. And how do you react to it, right? And how do you react to this fear, the, this unknown? Um, you know, I have friends who uh, um, were victims of sub uh, suicide bombings in Jerusalem. And, you know, I've talked to them afterwards and they've told me like, just at the time, you have no idea what's happening. You just, you're just reacting and you're hoping that the people around you are gonna help you and you're gonna help them. Um, you know, uh, we've been talking recently because a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was, there was a shooting on the subway in Brooklyn and people have been asking me like, uh, you know, how knowing, knowing what happened and what you learned from that, um, how, what does that do to your book? Like, you know, how does it relate to your book? And so, uh, Andrea and I have been basically saying that, uh, what happened a couple of weeks ago in Brooklyn that's the way we're hoping kind of humanity reacts, right? New Yorkers coming together to help one another, people pull each other into different cards, doctors jumping in to help. Our story is sort of the other end, the cautionary tale of what happens if that doesn't happen, right? right. We as humans uh, are very divided, divided right now. Uh, I'm sure today a lot of people have seen that uh, the last couple of years. Um, as as humans and you know especially in america there are a lot of political racial sexual cultural divisions mm -hmm. and what i really wanted to explore in the story was how does a divided america come together when the lights go off what happens when we just have to say hey you know what we're humans and we need to work together to survive can we put aside all the shit? can we put put aside everything that defines us democrat republican liberal conservative can we put, you know, put color, race, religion, can we put all that aside to really work together to stay alive? And that was really the impetus for the book. Hmm. Uh, it's, yeah. it's great. I think you really capture what you're saying, that moment of pure chaos where something's happening, but you don't know what and how you, how people react in that moment and do what you're saying. The old watchman gambit of like, we need something big enough that scares everyone into being nice <laughs> to each other. Yeah. And, and, and it, it's real. Thank you. I mean, it's definitely, like I said, you know, the, the inciting sort of inspiration was definitely post 9 11. I wrote this thing originally almost 20 years ago, and it has evolved over the last two decades. And it started off as a novel, and then it turned into a comic book. And as it has evolved, and as editors have touched it, as, you know, uh, myself and, and, and everyone who's kind of helped sort of add pieces and parts to, to how we brought it into life, the story has evolved as well. You know, we've, it's endured so much over the last two decades, uh, so much political uh, nonsense, so much cultural nonsense. And, and it really, hopefully, we, you know, we hope, Andrea and I hope that it really comes out in the, in the comic. 
Yeah, it definitely feels yeah. very present, like you're saying. I mean, just to mention yeah. for those who are interested in picking it up, I mean, we can see even here on the cover, somebody's wearing masks, but some people are wearing masks on the subway. Some people are not wearing masks on the subway. There's uh, MAGA hats that people are wearing. There's a whole discussion about that. So there's a lot of stuff that feels very present and current there. Uh, Andrea, though, to turn it over to you, what was your biggest task in terms of crafting the look and the world of the book? So, uh, you know, the story seems uh, at the beginning a, a, a normal, classic, crazy story about the bunch <laughs> of people, different people, and they have to try to help each other in the, a real situation. I mean, could happen to us, for example, that nothing incredible could happen. And the point was uh, the where the action take place because we are underground, beneath the ground, in a subway, in a train, so the environment is not really sexy. I mean, okay, that's <laughs> it. Very dark, very uh, with cold lights. As and a New I Yorker, love, I'm deeply offended uh, by that take. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, no, that's the point. I, I love this kind of situation. So my point was to move in a direction where the black could be alive and using some colors like very pop sometimes and in the same time, not descriptive description colors, but like a, a feeling colors to put the readers in the same feeling, the same approach, a lot of mindful, uh, as our characters are doing or, or thinking or acting in some ways. So sometimes you can see totally off color. I mean, it's, it's not that real, but in the same time, there's talking to you. I mean, the, the colors are a good part because it's very vibing, the high vibe. And very natural with the stains, with the with watercolors, and I try to move the water inside the colors, and using maybe four or five palette and not much. But I really like the the approach. And issue by issue, you can see you see the sign, the ink is gonna be nervous and nervous and nervous. Like the moment at the beginning, every single step beneath, beneath, beneath something like a falling in the dark and uh, the fighting of the characters, uh, the, the good moment, the right moments, uh, the bad moments. So something really in, you know, with something current with the, the situation, not only, okay, I have to do color, yellow, blue, no, something <laughs> more detailed. Yeah. Well, and I love what you're saying because I think you're saying like the subway is a confined space. It's not a beautiful space. But exactly. you, you do such a great job in the book of coming at it from different angles. So it always we're seeing different, uh, like the backs of characters' heads in shadow. You create sort of a uh, a whole environment, a whole world around this really confined space that everyone's trapped in. Was, yeah, what's the point? When when we when I first started working on this, I was really nervous because I was worried, like, how are we going to create a story that basically takes place in the dark? How are we going to have? Are we going to have five issues of just like? black panels and which uh, to some people is amazing some artists love that but um what andrea was, has been amazing about is he's been taking color and making color a character in the ensemble yeah. right yeah um color really plays a part in setting your tone and setting and also paired with each of our the characters in, in the actual ensemble you really understand what they're feeling at any given point even when all the lights go off and I think that is what really has made this a successful book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, Neil, I did want to ask you, or maybe this is a question for Andrea as well, but there's obviously been a lot of discussion about comicsology and the changes that have happened physically with the platform. I'm sure those were in the works for a while. I don't know if they were the works when you started doing the book for them without biting the head that feeds you or anything like that. Uh, I'm just curious, how are you making sure that it's still a good reading experience given the changes to comicsology and how they're executing the comics uh, online? Do you want to take that? Or... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we, we really kind of approached it um, as a comic, right? We approached this as a, a, any comic that I would create, any graphic novel that I would create. And it's really about, there's a lot of page turns and there's a, you know we, we didn't really spend a ton of time on focusing on uh how it would really fit the platform at first because mm -hmm. i think that when you're creating a book for a digital device there's definitely you could see it like with webtoons and tapas there's definitely a way to create a comic that fits that experience 
we really approached it, the two of us, I believe, is, you know, we're going to create a comic the traditional way. And what Comixology has been really amazing with, you know, the folks there, the production folks, they've been really kind of guiding us into their guided view, right? Basically saying, hey, when you're creating a book, when you're creating this book, just be careful about these few things, you know, double page spreads don't really work on a guided view. Um, when you're lettering, and thankfully, I, you know, I, I letter the book, make sure that the lettering doesn't cut across panels or, you know, fits in a way that we can kind of move from panel to panel when somebody's viewing it on their device. So as I was doing sort of like the design and production of it, I really was trying to keep their, uh, their not restrictions, their guidelines sort of in mind to create it. And they've been, like I said, they've been fantastic about taking the amazing artwork and, you know, the the pages that we ended up with and really um, making sure that it works within their experience. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it does, I, it's not like it, they're trying to restrict you with their rules. It's just like, Hey, this is how we do it. And it, it's not like a, a punishment. I feel like the book <laughs> and we obviously didn't read it in that same capacity. It works any which way. So yeah, like, you know, look, I'm no... a, I trade, I'm a, I'm a product designer. I design apps and websites for a living, right? And when you're designing an app and a website and you come up with all these crazy bells and whistles and ideas, you really have to kind of work hand in hand with your development team, right? Your developers basically say, hey, we know that you want this thing to kind of explode every five minutes, but here's the technical constraint in making that happen. <laughs> and yeah. so I think it's the same thing. I think it's basically Comixology just working with a creative team and saying, you guys can do what you want. But if you want this to work really well on both experiences, both in the Comixology app as well as the eventual print uh, that we're going to be doing with Dark Horse, cool. this is kind of the way we, we recommend that you create it. And yeah. I don't think it's something that I don't think, and Andrea, I can't speak for you, but I didn't feel hampered by it at all. I just felt mm -hmm. like all right, these are the guidelines in which we need to play and we won't do a double page spread and we'll letter it this way and we'll kind of create it. <laughs> yeah. This the Sistine yeah. Chapel was like Michelangelo. Let's keep it to the ceiling, bro. Like yeah, none yeah, of the wall. Yeah. We're just doing the the roof, buddy. Right, and, and he brought in you know pans and pots to put on the floor, and it was fine. Yeah, see, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Oh, the fun the was still the story. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 The mean, Sistine yeah. Chapel, the original guided view. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, when I went there, they gave me a guided view of the Sistine Chapel. Yeah. Yes, I had to zoom and click on the ceiling. Mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> so, as you mentioned, this is going to be published down the road. Is it September when it's coming out as a collected edition of Dark Horse? Is that correct? So, I think November. November, November the yes. okay. November seventh. But obviously, the world being what it is, you never know what there's going to be supply chain issues. The date we're giving right now, given right now is November. The book is going to be amazing. We're really excited to have it out in the world, both as issues, both as a uh, collected edition. And hopefully enough people will pre-order and support it that we can do more. You know, that's yeah. yeah. It's uh it's not only beautiful, but it's intense. It's a hell of a it's a hell of a story. And uh Keith, I'd rather Keith. read it than experience it for sure. You are also beautiful <laughs> and intense, just so you know. Oh, <laughs> that's exactly right, right back at you, buddy. Uh, now, Pete, as um, if I may ask you a question, you don't live in New York anymore. That's Did right. this take you back to any sort of subway <laughs> it did. Uh, it was anxiety? Like, I was like, as soon as I started reading this, I was like, man, I don't miss this at all. I'm, I'm <laughs> on an adorable little trolley. I don't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. Do you um, think uh, are you going to do a land of make believe with Mr. Rogers? <laughs> That's uh, right. Mr. Yeah. Are you going to do a sequel to this set in Philadelphia, where ever people are trapped <laughs> in a trolley <laughs> outside? <laughs> Yeah, so Every single one side in San Francisco. Way. It's on the, the trolley in yeah. San Francisco. So. <laughs> yeah. But Perfect. Detroit, it's I... all in the cars. It's all the cars. It, it'll be like the Speed 2 cruise control of sequels. So I'm really <laughs> yeah. looking forward to it. I. Uh, so without getting into too much of the spoilers, just because the book did just come out today, what potentially can people expect over the course of the rest of the run? What can you tease about the book? Uh, so it's definitely uh, a really tight, intimate psychological drama it's about the people it's about the survivors right um i like to tell people it's the walking dead without the zombies right so it's about yeah. really this group that has to come together and survive something horrific without knowing what that horrific thing is but while they're trying to get out uh of this situation other horrific things happen to them right um i've never really been alone under the hudson river walking you know from new jersey to new york but this is sort of my worst case scenario of what that might be like. Oh 
Um, and there's some real surprises along the way. And what's great about it is that it's really kind of open. And we do have more volumes planned uh, down the road. But obviously, like I said, that depends on pre-orders and, and sales. But um, there's definitely a larger, a larger uh, event that's happening uh, that we're, we're hoping to get to. I would say there's a lot of surprises. I mean, there's a guy named Pete. You just throw off the subway for no reason. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like, oh, come on. Based on you. So that's fine. <laughs> yeah. There you, go. Yeah, you guys had Pete. an altercation back in the day where you threw Pete physically off. <laughs> yeah. It was hard getting those doors open, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's what the movie you Throw you Mama. The train. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. what the movie Throw Mama from the Train was based on, except it was about Pete. Right. Pete. Yeah. yeah. I don't know where I'm going with the that. The original Mama. Uh, Neil, Andrea, thank you so much for coming on. The book is awesome. Everybody yeah. should go check it out. Appreciate it. Looking forward to whatever terrifying things happen in the next couple of issues. <laughs> well, thanks for checking it thank out. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Right. Right. Thank you Have a so good night, much. guys. You too. A pleasure. Get back to your X Men. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. Once again, the book is called The Panic. It is out now from Comixology Original, so you can get it on that platform. There. I mean, we should just say, yeah. Just before we move on, I mean, I, you got to be Nightcrawler, right? When you're going to play the X Men game, you know, the old arcade version. I mean, oh. Nightcrawler was the best one to use. Um, Nightcrawler was cool, but I'm more of a, I mean, Cyclops, um, shouts to Neil, um, who yeah. plays the game on a daily basis about it. Colossus is the one. Am I right? Really? I used to, maybe I'm thinking of a different one, but I used to do the Sentinel always because that was, that seemed crazy over. Of course you're the Sentinel. Dude. What? That's that's also, I, li that's also I like hunting you mutants. I you like hunting mutants. That's, that's, that's the whole that's, point of it. That's the, the Cyclops the move guys. is to say I'm the Sentinel. Unbelievable. <laughs> the Sentinel Unbelievable. was great. The Sentinel was totally overpowered. I'm terrible at these fighting games. The fact that I could stand there and be like, missile, 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 missile. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Straight bullets, right. It, that's Capcom versus X-Men. This is the oh, original X-Men game yeah, where exactly. it was just like, you, it was like turtles in okay. time. You just run around a very limited area and fight yeah. random people that jump in and are like, ah! Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, what did you play in Capcom versus X Men then? While we're bringing this up, well, I would always go Wolverine and the Hulk, and then Spider Man. Those were my three. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I didn't uh, really Kevin play. asked if you would play if I would play Cipher, and I did. But the way you played Cipher is you go in the back and rewire the machine. Yeah. Playing Cipher in that game is not playing it and sitting at home and reading a book. <laughs> reading the comic books. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, but before we move on, uh, this side conversation, this book is fantastic. The Panic. Uh, Def, check it out on Comixology Originals. Absolutely. Why don't we bring in our next two guests, as soon as I can find them in this platform here. They are two of the writers for The Fox Family Values, which is coming out from Archie Comics. They also have a slew of other projects we're going to be able to talk about. Dean Hashbill in the stream. Hello, Dean. How are you? And Hello. Vito Dosante hey. here as well. Oh, Hello. Hello. Hey. We got hey, fellas. here. So it worked. to see you guys. It yes, worked. It worked. It worked. We did it. Let's talk about the Fox Family Values, which is coming back to Archie Comics. So tell us about this book. What is different in the world of the Fox this time? And I believe you two didn't directly work together. You wrote two different stories, right? Or did I get that totally wrong? Right. Okay. That's right. But we were we were tasked with the same mission, which was to make comics better in mm. a Fox one shot. And, and Vito had to do it in five pages, and I was tasked to do it in 12 pages. Oh, wow. Mm. Including an Alex Which makes me the genius. <laughs> <laughs> makes me the genius because you did it in five. That's right. That's right. Confused. It's like name that yeah. tune. Three part structure, who, five who pages. It's it three pages. I know, right? Name that tune. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a really difficult thing because we were asked by Archie to uh, make comics better and, and alter the industry in, mm. in this, this effort. And I think we pulled it off. What do you think, Vito? I think um, we come out in two weeks, and I think it's probably going to be the Mayan end of the world oh, wow. after the book comes out, because what, what's the point? That's, what's the point after that? That's right. Alex Toth is in our book. That's right. 
That's incredible. So, I mean, how does that feel? Because both of you have worked in comics for so long, knowing that you're releasing a book that is going to end comics. Yeah. That has to be a little bit of a conflict <laughs> inside of your heart. Right? Yeah, but it, it, somebody had to do it. Go, Go out on, on top. top. Go out on, <laughs> on top. Yeah, exactly. No, but in all seriousness, um, I, I haven't worked on the Fox in a little while because I was working on the Red Hook uh, for yeah. about five years, including some other uh, little gigs here and there. And so it was really cool to revisit the character. And I thought about, well, what, what's going on with, with these folks now, right? But more importantly, uh, since there hasn't been a Fox comic in about four or five years or however long it's been, I was like, well, this also needs to serve as an introduction to for new readers, right? So I was trying to honor what I had done in 10 issues with uh, Mark Wade, Wade writing some of the best dialogue in comics. Oh, and yeah. he's also a phenomenal writer, but to be Great. able to collaborate with him. And then when I found out that Vito was writing a, a Fox story, I was like, oh, my God, of course. He's awesome. Vito should be writing the Fox as well, you know? Great. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I pitched two story ideas. And um, uh, Jamie Lee Rotanti, who's the editor, uh, picked one of them. And then I wrote a 12-page story. It's pretty tight. There's a lot going on in 12 pages. I know that... Um, you know, when I was growing up reading comics, you pick up an issue of like Marvel two and one starting the thing and you got an epic story in like 22 pages, you know, yeah. now those 22 pages, as we've discussed over the years, has become six issues. Right. Yeah. With, you know, certain nuances, expanding on scenes, yeah. whatnot. But I kind of went back to that old school style of like really packing it in, but also trying to tell something that means something. And it not only entertains, but, you know, has a heart. You know, possibly oh, nice. even educates a little bit. Uh, I mean, I think there's something too, like making comics better is going back to that style where it is a little bit more of a punch um, in the I face when you read a book in a good way, where it's like you um, get get so much at once. Even if in those Marvel Tune ones, some of the last couple of pages, you see the panels getting smaller and smaller. Yes. And like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think yeah, it's like, and the thing was fine. Oh, That's is that right. the end? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for those who don't know the Fox, though, who aren't familiar with the character, could you give like a, a capsule summary of the idea of what makes this character special? Well, Vito, uh, let's hear your voice. Um, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, nice Vito. Nice <laughs> you it. Um, I don't. Here's the, the reality: is you know we can talk about the history of the Fox, you know, from the Golden Age to now. Um, I don't think any of that really matters. I think Dean is probably, I'll put it to you this way. When I did my story, um, I pitched a couple of different stories, you know, uh, two or three. And uh, the one that ended up getting picked actually was changed. It was the Fox and another guest star. And um, they're like, well, you know, we're trying to keep guest stars out of it. Can we just keep it to the, you know, like the central um the central cast and then what i had to do is i had to go back to what dean had done and it all became about a family and you know i'll let dean expound on that a little bit more but realistically i didn't have anything to work from or i didn't have to work on any uh, work on anything from anything else that wasn't you know uh the fox hunt or you know freak magnet or anything like that so really what Dean and Mark established in there in the in the two volumes that came before this were really all I needed to do. So um, for anybody that's listening, watching um, that will read the book, you don't really have to go into the minutia of, you know, anything that the DC impact line did uh, anything that came in the seventies worth uh, like rich Buckler or anything like that, or, or even, you know, going back to when Erwin Hayson, uh, created a character back in the 40s. Like, you can really just go to your store, pick up these two, uh, last two volumes, and you'll you'll be caught up, you know, like immediately. But, um, uh, you know, you know this character better than I, than I, I think any of us do. Well, I think it, 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 to pick up where you left off, Vito, like, the, the comic book that made me want to dedicate my life to making comic books was the Fantastic Four, which is a family book, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of young kids, uh, you know, when they pick up a comic book back when we, we were picking up comics early on, like 
that was a kind of an escape, right? You would go and you either want to be a superhero, Spider-Man, Batman, but there was something about the Fantastic Four and that, that, that group value, which I think permeates this family values one shot, right? Like you, you your story, Vito, deals with a, a certain kind of commitment that's going to happen. Uh, my story, uh, I realized, well, if, if the fox is a freak magnet, well, maybe it's a family curse of freak magnets. Yeah. And, you know, there's the wife and the son, including um, our main hero, this dude who's kind of a reluctant hero. And how do they all deal with the fact that they've been cursed by this freak magnet situation, right? Like, things get drawn to them whether you like it or not. You know, villains are going to pop out of, out of nowhere and come at you. So each character, the three main heroes, deal with that concept very differently. And again, I wanted to show that off, just set that new premise in this this one shot. So, um, and and also Vito, you you write about family and stray. Your 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 creator own comic is is a kind of a family, yeah. me, you know. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, I think, you know, we're t we're kidding around about saying you know making comics better and stuff, but I think universal themes will always be applicable to just about every uh, situation in every comic book, uh, any any kind of story. So family's universal. We, like, we can probably write three years worth of Fox stories just based on family, you know, and like the, the way the son interacts with the mother, the way the mother interacts with the father, the way, you know, like um, it, it's, it's kind of a, like an overflowing fountain and well of, like source material like you never run out of stories about family you know because you know by and large we all have a form of family whether it be by birth by blood or by choice with your friends you know so yeah. it's it's a very it, it'll never run dry you know, you know what's funny of, about that, that? Kind of it's like dynamic it's an evergreen topic right but what's funny is like if if i was a kid right. or, or like i would be like initially I'd be like, it's about family. I don't want to read a comic book about family. You know, like, that's the point, right? Like, but like the Avengers is a family. You know, the, the characters I created in the Red Hook are these misfits that kind of become a family, right? Well, the, and the I, Wizard I, I of just, Oz. What? Oh, I was going to say, um, jumping on what you're saying about accessibility, I feel like, yeah, a kid might not be like, I'm going to read a book about family. I want to see superpowers. But by the end of it, they're like, oh, I know a guy like the Human Torch. He's crazy. Um, that's and, right and i think like that's the real core of comics and like accessibility when i was a kid you know we i would go to like the gas station and they mm -hmm. had a spinner rack there and like i had no other access to stories like this and i was like this is a gold mine and obviously it's different now and there's almost too much access to it but i think comics still has that unique thing of giving you sort of the the in you, the sexy in, the dazzle, razzle dazzle in, and then the real in, which is the family you're talking about. Well, really, I mean, like what's great about right. superhero comics is that it's 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 all genres put together. It's romance, it's crime, it's science fiction. It, it's it's how you use it, right? And then the way you relate to it is through human connection, you know? Yeah. And that kid that you knew that reminded you of Human right. Torch, I mean, he went to jail for burning your friends, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. How'd you know? And that's what we learned. You can't burn your friends, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Allegedly. That's why we have Allegedly. comics. That's Allegedly. why we have <laughs> comics. That's why we have comics. You get to burn your friends through a fantasy. Not the reality yeah. that we... By the way, this is a little bit of a side note, but I was watching Pete's face while you were talking, doing that little monologue there, Justin, and he was completely stone-faced up until you mentioned spinner racks, and then he was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying spinner rack Very works fun. now. Very fun. Oh, uh, you, I do want to ask you, you guys mentioned a couple of other projects that you're working on. Vito, you have Stray, which I believe is coming back. Uh, what yeah. can you tease about that? Yeah. Uh, what can I tease about it? It's going to be a seven-issue story that we're doing exclusively on Kickstarter. Um, when we do put out the collection, Action Lab will put out the collection with a secret eighth issue. So we, what I wanted to do is I wanted to right. kind of make it special for the people that have backed the book and who have supported the book, but also I wanted to give retailers a reason to care about the book. Um, 
I've always found it weird about Kickstarter that we were always expecting people to kind of double dip, like buy uh, buy it, back it on Kickstarter, but then also buy it at the uh, comic book store level. So if I'm going to, you know, ask you to buy a book more than once, I really want you to get something uh like more bang for your buck so um this series is called i you know i I don't know why we didn't do this earlier but like it just it just made sense you know um but what this series uh kind of involves is basically it's called requiem and it's uh you know a mass for the dead is what what uh what a requiem is and stray is going to have to go through his own born again type storyline uh, where he gets everything taken away from him and he, what's left. Like in the first um, mini, we explored what does this hero want to be? Does he want to be the same type of hero he was? Does he want to be as, you know, a replacement for his father or does he want to be something different? In the second one, we just looked at his history a little bit uh, in the Rottweiler years just to see how he became who he be, who he is now and what those choices did to inform the hero that he is today. So as a result, now we're taking everything that you saw in the first two volumes and throwing everything at him and saying, okay, well, you've made your choice. You've made your bed. Now you're going to have to lie in it and you might not like where you end up. So. Yeah. Uh, also, you... Vito, I, I don't know if Vito knows this, but I'm going to be writing the next stray story. And it's called Give a Dog a Bone. Oh, Ooh, wow. wow. That's huge. Huge announcement right it's here adult. on the show. It's an it's adult, adult. It's an adult version. We're going to like expand <laughs> to the back of the comic book store. That's really oh, high on the spinner rack. You got to really reach. <laughs> yeah, 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 way up there. Very high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, I will say you uh, snuck us a copy of this book, and it is harrowing like it yeah. is really rough to read like it's good but it's really tough to read so i i don't oh, think that under selling that page yeah. will kill you well oh, and you, you do such a great job oh, well, you know of that's doing glossy superhero storytelling and then you have like an emotional hard emotional fit yeah. at the end that gets you yeah it's you know it, and it goes back to you know, what we were talking about with the fox and everything and it's it's like Dean was saying, human connection is just about everything, like in storytelling. Um, I tend to look at superheroes as American mythology. And myths were created to explain thunder and to explain why the sun rose in one side of the world and went in the other side. So we can use superheroes to tell stories about loss and about dealing with, uh, you know, Spider-Man. This is a very good example about a guy trying to make, you know, like we don't as kids, when, when we read Spider-Man, we didn't see that. We just, you know, went straight for, well, he's in the vulture in the face. Like, why is this old man flying in the, you know, whatever, you know, like, but he had to hustle and he had to make money and he had to take care of his aunt. And those are the things that as we got older, we really latched onto. Um, with Stray, I, I, you know, I've always wanted Stray to reflect, uh, the world around me, like in 2022, and I always wanted Stray to be somewhat autobiographical, but then be a little fantastic, you know, like to be something bigger than just my life, you know, like, because once you do that, you get people to relate, you know, the, the character to their lives. So, yeah. you know, it, it, it has to be it has to be personal at some point but it also has to be relatable and and i don't think uh with all the stray stuff that i've written thus far i don't think anything's been as personal as this uh since the first one so uh, i'm very happy with um marcello's artwork with um all that we have to it's an to be a creator like now, because we have so many avenues, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, uh, Comixology, you know, we have all these different avenues and we do get a chance to tell these stories kind of unrestricted. 
uh, or we put our own restrictions on them uh, if necessary. But uh, what a great time to be alive, man. Yeah. And <laughs> Sorry, we're going to end it all in two weeks. Though. I know. So, wow. Yeah. Really intense. Uh, speaking of relatability and mythology, <laughs> um, uh, I want to ask Dean, like, how you um, explain the myth of why I end up at Sonny's in Red Hook every like once a month drinking? <laughs> is that is there any sort of relationship? Well, this is this can... is some niche content right here. But... Well, I mean, not to get too deep. This into is it, but inside like, baseball. I, it is. I've bumped into. We've known you guys for years. I've bumped into Dean at Brooklyn <laughs> Social on Smith Street, like truly probably ten years ago at this point. And had like a long talk. There are other comic people there. I can't remember who, but um, remember talking to you. And Vito, I feel like you, you used to work at Jim Hanley's Universe, like truly so long ago. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing you For there about talking comics. Eleven with you. years. I we I yeah. shot a web series, like truly fifty, almost fifteen years ago now in Hanley's, and I That's think right. we were there the night we were shooting. Um, so like, there's a there yeah. is re- huge relatability mythology here. But Red and Hope Justin, I don't know if you know this, but uh, you, me, and Pete have been doing a podcast for a while too. <laughs> that doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> if it's not in a comic, I have a hard time understanding. All right. Uh, definitely. And to be fair, we've been trapped in a podcast underneath the Hudson River for for eighteen years. But uh, if I was to cast uh, Sam Brogia, who plays the Red Hook, Justin, you're do you act? You act right. You've done no oh, classically trained. trained. Classically, classically trained. He, I can see it, man. I can see Let it. No. <laughs> All right. I'm get on that. Right get on that. I like it. I like it. Oh my god. Uh, well, let's talk about the Red Hook since you brought that up. So that is running on the Webtoon platform, which, right. to be honest, is something we should cover here more here on the show. And yes. don't because it's so huge. It's enormous. Yeah, right. I think like the people who spend a lot of time talking about. Oh, I have issues with comics. With they're always talking about DC and Marvel, and they don't realize Webtoon eclipses all of that exponentially. Um, what is it like yeah. though, working for that platform, creating things for that platform? Because it is such a different experience. It, it is a different experience, and and I, I used to think it wasn't a different audience, but it absolutely is a different audience. You mm-hmm. know, like in fact i don't think superheroes do as well on these platforms uh they they do better in print and graphic novels and in cinema frankly um i think that uh the the metric is that there's more fans for like romance soap opera stuff you know manga style a little bit more more like that you know and i'm kind of like the old man that showed up and was doing my like 1960s superhero pastiche right um (laughs) but in a modern in modern terms uh yeah there's alcohol here right there's drinking happening here for it oh look there's there's a version of there's me. There's uh, <laughs> but um the format is interesting because you know uh the creepiest thing i can say to people is when they ask me what i do i said uh i'm in your pocket right now you can read my comics for free because everyone has a phone right yeah. so we're pocket, creating these right things now. for to, to be scrolled through and don't forget, I was a, a creator and co-founder of Activate, which was a web, co- a free web oh, yeah. Yeah. collective that started on LiveJournal, the blogging platform, in 2006. So um, I was kind of a, a ahead of the curve a little bit, you know, knowing that uh, people were going to be more online as we are, um, and and trying to figure out the best way to present online, you know, and deliver these comics. And I started off doing it free. And frankly, this is free too, except I uh, got a deal where I get paid to own something uh, that you can read for free, you know? Um, the problem I, I've discovered though, if, if I can be frank a little bit, is that when it's free and it's online, you're competing not with people's money, but with their time, yeah. you know? We're yeah. on social media all day long. You read some news things, then maybe you're you're watching your TV now on your laptop these days. Like, you'll get to the comics later, you know. And yes, there are some comics that blow up and have like five million readers a week. You know, that's not me. You know, a lot of my readers are still hopefully looking for me at the comic shop. And luckily, you know, I have Webtoon, but then I've had also Image Comics uh, publish the first two volumes in print. You know. Yeah. Uh, but then I took a little uh, step back because I realized I want to maybe collect all this into an omnibus uh, at some point soon. But uh-huh. I did have to think about how when whenever I drew a page of Red Hook Comics, I was kind of in my head laying it out twice. 
I was laying it out for the virtues of the vertical scroll comic, you know, on your phone at Webtoon. But then also, how would it look in print eventually? Because I still love exploiting the real estate of the blank page that we're all so used to, you know? And how would I make that work? And 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 so it's like almost like every time I drew a page, I was I was tr thinking of it in two different ways. And trust me, there is a huge difference in pacing and the way the story is delivered between what we're looking at right now as a vertical scroll versus uh, the print edition. Um, and eventually, well, we'll I, you know, I listen. My heart is in print, although I made a lot of hay doing web comics. You know, since two thousand six. Yeah. I mean, you you brought up the pacing. That's the big thing for me. And to be perfectly honest, I'd say like, maybe this is me being old, but it's definitely me being old. old. Just yeah. went. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Uh, you're the young one on the podcast. <laughs> the <laughs> trying to read Webtoon is difficult for me because it's really a retraining of the brain, particularly not to get too floofy about it. But in terms of like Scott McCloud talking about the blank space, the white space, like how you skip the time between the panels. The, the, the yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like, yeah. it's hard for me to pace it out the same way when I'm reading something on the vertical page or even like we were talking about earlier with comiXology. I mean, it, do you, it seems like same you have the same. Well, yeah. Well, same thing happened to me with reading. Remember when uh, like Akira came out and, and I think it was like, was that the late 80s, early 90s? But it came out and it was paced like left to right hand page comic right then later on you find out oh no all japanese comics are done the opposite way right mm -hmm. and then recently in the last decade or two maybe two decades that i'm showing my age most manga that is, is published back to front and i don't know how to read that way yeah <laughs> I, I have a tough time well that. yeah that's i was gonna say like it's funny how many different formats there are that we have to kind of retrain ourselves to read a certain way. Um, speaking of comicsology, I remember the first time I accidentally got onto Guided View, and it was so jarring because it, it, comics are not just about the panel; it's about the page. So whenever you read it, you absorb the whole thing, but you're also going step by step by step. So with webtoons, you know, because you're scrolling. Uh, I can't remember. There was another one that was scrolling too, not Tapas, but another one. But it, it just, it's so anti, you know, everything that we've learned uh, from day one, you know, like, and I mean, maybe it's because, you know, we're products of the American school system and we do read left to right. Um, but, you know, like, like everything else, like if you're, if you're down to try, you're, you're down to learn. You know, it, 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 it never, I've never had any problem when we, when I did uh, Purple Heart with Ricardo Venancio on uh, Webtoon, we almost ignored all those conventions and just did, you know, did it for the print. And what we would get as a, as the only criticism really was this one's too short. This chapter is too short. This one, you know, because the chapter, if I had a six panel page, that's only six, you know, like panels going up. Bing, 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 like Whereas, that, yeah. you know, like there, all the other ones are, you know, much longer, much broader. Uh, they're made for the format, less so for print. So, you know, the more successful ones, uh, Lore Olympus, uh, which, you know, book that thick. You can imagine how many uh, panels are in each chapter because, like, as it prints, it's literally a phone book. So, you know, like, it's such a learning curve as a creator that I don't know that uh, – I know because I didn't get a second season, I didn't ever get a chance to explore what that would be. But, you know, at the same time, I love that we didn't get a second season because everybody's still reading it and freaking out over the uh, the cliffhanger ending. Yeah, happy. We get we hope to do more Purple Heart. We've talked about that. But the I would thing love that to. I learned All the time. that was a little jarring as well was like I could draw an inset panel, just like a close up of an eye, or I could draw a splash page with all this stuff happening, and it looks the same on your phone. Mm. It's yeah. the same right. real estate on your phone. So you have yeah. to start thinking like, geez, Louise, what am I doing here? Right? Mm -hmm. Like 
and I think it shows it, in your in your Red Oak the the one we saw that like the, there's an inherent pacing to it that I think it w is the sort of adaptability you have to find where it's like you we could be like comics I think we all like, we're talking about the different ways we read them we're trained to read them the same way American comics but I also think we all go back and reread or look at panels differently we all have our unique mm -hmm. way of going through right. um, and the phone makes it like nope you're all gonna go this way and you can go yep. up a little bit and down but you it's mm -hmm. only it's direction it's uh, right, it's all direction. about direction. So, like in a in your print comic, your traditional print comic, the reveal is you turn the page and then it's on the left side. Usually, that's what you try to paste. So you get two pages yeah. and then maybe a reveal, or you're asking a question or or a little mini cliffhanger per page to get to the next page. Right, in webtoon or in the vertical scroll comic, um, it's at the bottom. It's at the bottom. Yeah, you're pulling yeah, up. You're always pulling up. You know, and you, and it's down at the bottom. And that, that's pretty crazy. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's an interesting challenge. And like I said, I tried to do my best. And the, the dirty little secret is, and this is what I did at Activate with Billy Dogma back in the day, was I just, I, my restriction was squares. I just kept everything a square. It was a close-up of Vista. It was inside a box. And that's what I did. You know, and that was the click view, you know, kind of thing. And I'll say this, Justin or, or Alex, I don't know if you guys write plays or not. I, I've written a bunch of plays and screenplays and stuff. But I feel like the webtoon format is great for play, right. for play, you know, for dialogue, right. for lots of talking, yeah. you know. So. Right. It, it moves uh, that yeah, aggressive. I, I mean, you're talking about uh, like writing a screenplay or even reading a screenplay. It's there's a visual component to it because it's like dialogue, action, dialogue. You are doing you're spacing it out almost like a comic. And like you're, it's right. all vertical. It's all like the flow of that. So it is. Totally and it's graduate. You graduate down. Right. And what's interesting yeah. about um, web the vertical scroll versus print is that I was lettering inside the panels, but in the vertical scroll, you can do outside the panel and have a long tail because again, you're kind of controlling a pace. So you're not yeah. whipping by, you know? Hmm. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, I think uh, the, the uh, audience for webtoons actually enjoys reading. Um, and that's sometimes not so conducive to what comics are because comics are both you know they're both the visual and they're they're the literature a part of it uh jim Handley's universe where art and literature meet that's you know <laughs> kind of what uh, their slogan was for years and it's true you know that's what comics are they're art and literature and i find that the webtoon audience is probably more and maybe it's because it's an international audience that are trying to find going back to everything else we said universal themes they're going to kind of gravitate more towards reading than in looking at something and maybe like justin like you were saying going back to it to look at the visuals uh later yeah. right uh hey dean i wanted to ask you just because you brought it up uh you are bringing <laughs> billy dogma back for the Image Comics 30th anniversary yes. anthology cool. collection, uh, yes. what has it been like revisiting this? Uh, it, it's funny because like I forgot how to draw him and Jay. <laughs> <legit, so. laughs> I was like, wait, I haven't drawn this like kind of like you know bastardized version of Popeye and or whatever the hell I've been I created you know in 1995. Um, and he's kind of slimmed down. Like, I don't know. I'm, I turned 55 at the end of May and I'm, and I, I've only gotten heavier, right. but, <laughs> but <laughs> something about keeping your hero a certain age, even though you want him to get a little older with you and a little more grizzled, but I don't know. I was, I was taking more care of him, you know, maybe I take care of <laughs> Billy Dogman. He, he can take care of me. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, that's like but, your love. Your, that's like your version of Love and Rockets. I was gonna say he's your Dorian Gray, really. Yeah, see, yeah. Like <laughs> drawing in, a, in yeah. an ice bucket. He's your uh, Luba. That's right, <laughs> my Luba. Um, but yeah, it was really. I had written the story that um, I I drew for Image. I wrote that about almost a decade ago, oh, and wow. I just hadn't had the time to figure out how to how to draw it or when to draw it. And when I spoke to Eric Stevenson, I was like. Hey, I, I'd love to be a part of the the uh, anthology, the anniversary, 30th anniversary of Image Comics, but I don't have like 12 one-page stories. I have a 12-page story, right? Which is why if you pick up the first issue, it, it, nothing's really happening yet, you know, with Billy Dogma. And then little by small, it's going to be another little, you know, dip into this thing. Altogether, it'll make more sense, obviously. Well, you're but the closer hopefully... of the book. You're the... Huh? And you're I'm the, the closer. closer. That's right. That's right. It's exciting. So... 
And I, I think that's a good thing. Um, that's good. Yeah. You get coffee. Yeah, yeah. Coffee's for closers. That's right, baby. Um, and so <laughs> it, it may feel a little unsatisfying per issue, but trust me, collected together, I feel is like kind of a classic Dean Haspiel weird romance story, you know, that has a lot of heart. So, well, and I will say you, you let us get a look at the full. Um, oh, that's right. I sent it together. to you. And I'll tell you what, it, I was like, <clears throat> Even though uh, it's it's a it's a story, it's an action story. There's a lot going on. I was like, I feel this romance sort of deep in my bones a little bit in a weird way. Like I don't know if it. I'm like it hit something in me where I'm like I feel like I've been in this relationship oddly. And, uh, I, again, the human connection. Great. Thank yeah. thank you thank you for that. Thanks for reacting that way because it's also a little weird. The the story yes. is funky, 100%. you know. Yeah, as I do right, but. Yeah. I think I found some stuff that like, I don't even necessarily totally explain, but it's what you bring yeah. to it. Because what I try to add to comics is what prose does really well. And when you're reading prose, you can't help but be the co-author because you're filling in the room, the couch, the, what is space, I don't care how well it's explained, you're imagining a lot, so you're the co-author. Same thing I was trying to do with this story and, and trying to do in my future comics is I'll hand you some stuff but the but I want you the takeaway to be yours, you know what you add to it. Nice. So I feel like I, I I left some some stuff out so that you you could and then and then it makes it more your story, you know, and there's more ownership in that way, right? Yeah, so, it works. It hit me. Yeah. Our story. It's our story. That's right. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Speaking of our story, the Fox Family Values comes out this month, right? Is there a date for it, or is it still? Is it the? Uh, I believe uh, it's May eighteenth. May so, yeah, the okay. Wednesday. Right. In, in it's Wednesday. it's two weeks from tomorrow. Yeah, all right. So not next week, but the week after. Yep. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to check it out. Very exciting. Uh, congratulations, guys. Thank you so much. Thank for you. That's on. great, so Daniel. You Love you guys. Always great to see you, Dean. I'll Thank see you at Sunny's. Just let me know which days you're there. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, big pandemic I, spot for me. So I'm um, shouts. To I that. feel you. I'll see you there. All right, guys. Thanks. Right. Thank so you, much. guys. Take care. Good night. All right. There we go. Okay, once again, that was Dino DeSante and Dean Hashbill, and the book is The Fox Family Values. The other things that we mentioned are Stray Requiem is going to come out to Kickstarter, I believe. Also, the Red Hook PTSD is now on Webtoon. And Billy Dogma, you can check out in the Image Comics 30th Anniversary Collection. So lots of stuff going on there. And speaking of lots of stuff, let's go on to more stuff. My favorite let's section, because you guys let's make do it up. more stuff. More it's more. your audience more questions. Content. All right. And for audience questions, all you got to do is drop a question and ask a question over here on Crowncast or in the comments on YouTube. Now, we talked about <laughs> this week's drink of the week, but what are you guys drinking, Pete? What are you? Uh, you were well, coughing just, a little bit before the show. What's going on? Well, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, the, I made a couple too strong, but uh, I'm just glad we made it past that se uh, segment because, like, the way you were eyeballing Vito's like open neck, like unbuttoned all the way down, <laughs> and the way you were just kind of like holding yours, being like, "Oh, exactly. God, yeah, oh my, like, my buttons!" Yeah, yeah I was just yeah. glad was that like, you made it through that because clutching my buttons. You were just like it's staring trapped. it down, just like mm. look at the way you're biting my lip, is. biting my bottom lip. You're, you're like, in I cotton prison, me. Alex. You got to yeah. open mm. up the buttons, release the beast. Mm. <laughs> I feel you, Vito. I feel you, nobody you. wants to see this. Uh, no, we yeah, all want to keep that button. Keep that button. You want me to? No. You want me to, you want me to do it? Those buttons go all the way down, right? I don't know, right? I don't know if these the buttons come off, actually. Yeah, yeah. The camera turn come off. <laughs> You've never unbuttoned them. <laughs> I've never taken off this shirt, man. You know how the buttons Look, work? He was born with that shirt on. Yeah. Keep it on. <laughs> and I'm it's down with like, it. It's like your uh, front door, your car keys. Uh, it's but for a shirt is what buttons are. Yeah. Oh, I, I don't get what you're talking about, but I appreciate it. Pete, what are you drinking? Oh, I'm drinking a little uh, vodka. And uh, let's see here. Uh, and a little peach pear, a little peach pear mix. Peach pear, no mix. <laughs> no <laughs> no follow-up questions. Little, little you, peach juice in there, a little you drink like a hobo from a community theater production. That's just the way you're always just like, I'm drinking vodka in a tin can. What are we thinking about? <laughs> mm, got some fresh peaches in here. Yeah. Well, I'm the hobo who lives in the park. <laughs> <laughs> Don't walk up into me when it's after dark. Then you walk oh, man, that's a great song. Justin, it looks like you've switched over 
to something else? What are you I drinking? I went from a um, Manhattan um, to, uh, let's keep it on trend, a little Deschutes. I'm running low. Oh, man. Fresh you love the Deschutes. I Fresh. save it special yeah. for the show. Nice. All right, why don't we get us some questions? We got one here on YouTube. This is from Stanley. What are your plans for watching Doctor Strange? Do you think the MCU has lost its focus and momentum? Coming Whoa! in hot with a question here. One movie and everything is oh, man. questioned. Wow. What is this movie expected to do? $150, 200000000 million this weekend? Something like this? I don't know, so man. there is that. Uh, it's barely I think, anything. I, I think the movies have not lost their momentum. They've expanded out a lot, and we'll see if they can sort of hold on to it, uh, keep the story on the track. Excuse me, when it's going so big. Marvel television, I think we've talked about, it feels like it's not a loss of momentum. It sort of feels like it's in a little bit of a track, and I, I'm hoping we get more of a breakout from that track. But I think the movies are, are going strong. And I think I'm going to see Doctor Strange on oh. Thursday afternoon. I'm going to see it early, uh, which never happens for old JT. Afternoon. Yeah, I think it, for me personally, I've... I, I don't know. I've reached like my limit is the wrong word, but it's definitely like it's a lot. It's a lot of Marvel. There's a lot of Marvel going on constantly. I'm still seeing all of it, but I am at the point now. Oh, where what it a doesn't... hero! I know. <laughs> wow. like, how dare you put yourself through that? How no, you... all I'm saying, oh. and I, I have talked to other people who feel this way as well, is there's a point where it's like it doesn't feel like this is special, exciting present anymore. It's more like here's the Marvel thing that's happening this week. But at the same time, everybody's watching the stuff on Disney Plus. Everybody's going to see the movies. So it doesn't matter. Like, there still is that momentum there. It's just more frequent. And they know that. The question is, like, is it going to get to a point where people are actually going to be worn out and the diehards are going to be worn out? And I don't think we're there yet, you know? No. I mean, it could be worse. We could be Star Wars. <laughs> yes. That, that's Maybe, maybe lost a little bit of momentum, just like a scotch. Just a tiny yeah, bit. Just a touch of moment. <laughs> yes. Pete, I know you're all in. You're all in. You're like Marvel all the time. Give me more Marvel. 45 all episodes day, day. of Moon Knight tomorrow. All. Let's do this. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's an exciting time to be alive that, um, you know, in some aspects um, that, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's never been a better time to be a nerd in the fact yes. that there's so much out there, there's so <laughs> many shows, there's so many. I mean, if you would have told little me that, like, dude, you're getting a Moon Knight fucking live action TV show that's going to be bananas. Pete, you're what if so? What what if I find a way to to time travel and okay. I run up to you in Rochester? First mouth, off, dude, full, watch mouth full back, of garbage dude. plate, mouth full of garbage plate, and I, I run up to P P A stab you. I went up to Peach at age six, age six, and I, I'm like, Pete, you're gonna get a moon night, and then I vanish. <laughs> what do you think your reaction is to that? Are I, you like perfect with I your little like, tiny six year old beard? I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like, who is that stranger, and why was he so close to a child? That seems unreasonable. What it okay? I then travel back in time right after Justin travels back in time, and I'm like, just to clarify, you're gonna get Moon Knight, but also <laughs> there's a non stop pandemic, upcoming climate disaster with the end of the world, and women are having their rights taken away. See you later. Oh, what do you think man. That? it's a, you know, classic thing about life is you get some things, and then a ton mm -hmm. of things are taken. I gotta away be honest, you. I feel like six year old Pete would be like, Moon Knight. Oh, come on. I, I gotta say, Alex, if you're traveling back to deliver that message, yeah, it's a bummer. <laughs> Pete, like, it's hey, a bummer I have one chance to time travel. I'm gonna go back to six year old Pete and let him know. Yeah. Be like, <laughs> buy KN95s. It's like, ah, sorry. Buy KN95s. Isn't there something <laughs> you could have done, time traveler? Literally anything else. Uh, all right, why don't we go to some questions here on Crowdcasts from Stray Bullet. Oh, this ties into what we were just talking about. Now that the pandemic has completely gone 100%, no doubt about it, and we're all going back to the movies and live shows, has anyone started going back to the comic shop on the regular? That was mostly digital pre-pandemic, but I've always felt a little bad about it. What do you guys think? Have you gone back to the old comic book shop? Pete, you've been frequenting them. Frequenting frequenting them You've occasionally frequenting you wow. freak <laughs> beat you're a fucking freak <laughs> what are you doing 
you freak. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to go to different uh, comic book shops uh, for sure around the area. Uh, I do miss my Midtown Comics, man. I do miss, you know, being there every Wednesday in a giant line of people, which now seems insane. But, um, yeah, and yelling at people who weren't obeying the line on the floor. You know, those were the good old days. Uh, the craziest thing for me is, like, I would go back to the comic book shop, but I don't ever go to Manhattan anymore. I used to be in Manhattan wow. every day uh, for working, audition, job, whatever I was yeah. doing I was in Manhattan doing something. And now I'm never, ever there. So oh, um, wow. I haven't been able to really, I think I've been to Midtown like twice um, recently, but um, I, I will go back there because I need that. Uh, my stacks are just the old stacks. I don't have new stacks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been going to, the main reason that I've been going to comic book shops, I've been going to Galaxy Comics in Brooklyn when we've been talking about older stuff on the stack. I always try to go there first to try to, support a local comic book store and they're usually on my way when I'm picking up my son from school or something like that. It's just relatively convenient, but, but yeah, same sort of thing. I'm not in Manhattan anymore uh, other than occasionally one day a week. So there's no real reason to go to Midtown or anything like that, but I do love it. I I thought for a second, you were just going to say that you were so busy. You just like go to a place in Brooklyn, just like throw your money in the door and just kind of close it. Like I don't have time. Yeah, it's a Subway sandwich shop, but, you know, they get the idea. Yeah, yeah. got to support your local Subway sandwich shop. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah, it's, it's still mostly digital, honestly. Um, I mean, we'll see if that changes at some point soon. But I I'm getting like roasted in the comments by um, Neil <laughs> Clyde and Liwana Nana about Brooklyn not having comic, uh, having comic book shops. And I'm like, yes, I know they have comic Yeah, book aren't shops. you right by Anywhere Comics as well? Which is uh, one of the best shops in Brooklyn. Ooh, what? Not- directly uh, by um but it is it is it is <laughs> near it. i wish i could it, tug the collar on the shirt but the buttons are so tight otherwise yeah, i do yeah, a no, classic you can't, yee, you hot can't collar. do your fun bit yeah oh uh, this is from big, oh big, yeah do we need big, to go over to the comments first yes we need to jump to the comments because we got a big one um a straight bullet but did the cat get it he uh big updated um it's pretty kitty which is the official name of your cat, right? Yeah. Did she get her 6 p.m. tree? Oh, shit. I forgot. Oh, no. ah! <laughs> oh man. Oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to go puff that fluff, man. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. We puff puff that fluff. We want to do it. All right. She's saying, I me. love Oof. that we're hearing news about what's going on in Pete's <laughs> cat household. Live in the comments thread. Um, that, the Whew, that was got, close. That was I got real when we started the play. show back 15 years ago, we started it to try to get news about Pete's cat, and that's finally panning out. <laughs> well, this just is... While you're saying that, the idea that we, when we started the show, were like, let's do some fun comedy about comics. And now we're like, Pete, did you feed your cat at 6 a.m. Matt, talk about going back in time and telling people what's up. Oh, that's man. Let's go back in time and tell the younger selves, <laughs> oh, yeah, hey, like, look at your future, yeah. you psychopaths. <laughs> this is on YouTube. Nelson Martinez says, have you guys seen the Nelson! movie and or read the comics of the bad guys? If not, what's the last animated film you've watched? My son loves the bad guys books. Everybody else in my family went to see it. One of the rare times I was in the city at work in the office uh, and they enjoyed it. They thought it was pretty good. Um, It's definitely very different than the books, apparently. But last animated film I've watched. Oh, my gosh. Uh, That definitely is not correct. But Mitchell's versus the machines, maybe. Yes. I don't know. That was pretty Uh, good. About turning red. Oh, turning red. Yes, that was great. Oh, wow. Anyone Comics is actually near me, and I've never been there. Whoa! Wow! Zalvin just changed your life. Changed it's on the other You're going to love Heights. it in there, man. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to go there. Um, I'm going to nice. take my kids there. Um, oh, boy. You just leave them there. You can pick them up at the <laughs> end when they're, just before they close. They'll take care of it. You'll come back, yeah. and they'll be in bins and bagged and boarded, and it'll be like... <laughs> I like love you, my kids. Professionally graded, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Near mint, pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. As a parent, um, uh, nice. yeah. Turning red is probably the most recent, but I watch a lot of animated films, sort of on repeat. Um, Pete, but that reminds me, Pete, did you check out the um, uh, Usagi series? 
Oh, well, that's the thing. I was very, very excited for that. And then I watched it, and it's kind of like a uh, kid's show where it's very different from the comics. Uh, It does reference the comics, which I was there for and really loved. But the story of a kid who really doesn't know what he's doing yet is not kind of the same story. Uh, So I watched, like, the first step, and I was just like, oh, man, this isn't. This really is wow. it's a different take, and I'm happy for like a maybe a wider audience or younger kids that'll kind of like maybe look up the comic. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, not made for me. Well, this is too bad. This is awkward. I, we thought we were you were going to be more excited about it. We actually have, and this is a big surprise. We have Stan Sakai, the creator of Yusagi Yujimbo here, Don't you do that. and I guess he's going to come in to tell you how disappointed he is in you. Okay, yeah, here we yeah. go. Here's Stan Sakai. Hello, Let's just you. have him do trivia. Let's have him do trivia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll go off to trivia. Don't worry about it. All right, we got one more question here. This is from Kevin. Do you have a favorite comic character who only ever appeared in a single arc, six issues or fewer, and who would play them in a movie? That's... Fuck, Kevin. That's a deep cut, bro. Fewer? How do you even... A, Oof. how do we think of it? B, how, how do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll throw one out at you. This is, I've mentioned this before on the show, but this is a comic book that just really stuck with me. There was this Spider Man issue where he met a kid who was being abused by his dad. And the kid, I think, got hit with some ray or something like that, but he got disintegration mm-hmm. powers in his hands. And I can still, right now, picture in my head what happens when his father goes to hit him. He puts up his hand. And his father hits his hand and it disintegrates his dad as he's going through wow. his hand. And it was so raw and traumatizing when I read it that the kid goes on the run. Spider-Man needs to help him talk about it. I feel like it was this one shot to talk about child abuse was what it was. And yeah. wow, like that That's affected intense, me though. so much as a kid. Um, yeah. I don't know that I necessarily would want to see that live action, but uh, that's definitely a character that, like, one issue. I think he came back, somebody brought him back for another, like, one shot or two shot or something 15 or 20 years later. Um, but uh, that character stuck with me. I don't know who would play him necessarily, but uh, it was good stuff. Yeah, all the characters that, like, I was like, oh, my God, these are cool, eventually got their own deals and started to be more and more into stuff, so... Unfortunately, I don't have that deep cut kind of like, oh, this one thing that no one's discovered yet. Um, I'm going to throw out um, the uh, the mist from the uh, first Starman arc. The, there's um, there's the old the mist, the sort of the Starman original Starman's villain. His son takes over at the same time that um, David Knight takes over as Starman. And those two characters, David Knight appeared later in the series, but those two characters were only alive in that time, in the first six issues. And seeing them um, uh, sort of in another element, another way would be cool. Yeah. All right. Good answers. And that is it for your audience questions. <laughs> and now it is time for trivia. And for that, we're going to turn over to Pete LePage. All right. This is the time where we normally give back uh, to the lovely audience, but Zelbs. Yeah. Wait, I, before, we move, before we move into this real quick, I just had a thought while we were playing this. It's like, now we're turning to Pete LePage and then the music gets like dangerous. It's like yeah. the music gets like a, an alarm is going off as if the show's saying, don't turn it over to Pete LePage. Um, and this is the first time I really heard the music <laughs> telling us. Um, what's yeah, happening. whatever you do, don't turn it over to people the page. So normally we give away a $25 gift card to Midtown Comics. Instead, bring in an audience member this week. We're going to have me and Justin are going to compete for trivia. I have a good feeling about us winning. Uh, and instead of doing a Midtown Comics gift card, we're actually going to donate to abortion funds. There is a link that I'm going to read now. It's secure.actblue.com slash donate slash fund abortion now and what it does is it takes your donation and splits it between 80 plus different local places that uh do that are abortion funds that are helping people out versus like a big organization like planned parenthood or something like that which 
obviously are great, but the local places are the ones that really need your help right now. It's a great spot to donate if you're feeling frustrated in this news moment uh, because it uh, sort of does a lot of things. Yes. So uh, we're actually going to double our donation as well. Normally we do $25. I'm going to double it. We're going to do $50 to the abortion fund. Let's see if Pete wins and we don't donate. Or we <laughs> win. Oh, we donate. Oh, man. See what happens. How, I don't know. Are we competing with each other, Alex? How's this <laughs> That's, right. No, I, That's right. I and have a good no, feeling about this, but no we'll hint. see what happens. There's no All right. hint. Take it away. Take it away, Pete. All right. Here we go. Uh, today's trivia is on topical comic news. And a small nod to the legend Neil Adams, R.I.P. All right, here nice. we go. Please listen to all three options before making your selection. Here we go, Alex and Justin. Okay. Question number one. Green Lantern is said uh-huh. to be leveling up with the blank. Is it? Power ring. Green ring. Sh- uh, the Shut ring up. he has. He has Shut a up. ring. I'm gonna it's a ring, I think. Things. I think it's the I'm ring. Gonna- Oh, it's, it's multiple then, choice? Yeah, Jesus. Oh, oh. Eliza oh, Dushku. Oh, uh, oh, good. Ruined the whole thing. Okay, is it A, the God Storm, B, Angel Rain, or is it C, Larry Hama? So, leveling up with, is it A, the God Storm, B, Angel Rain, or C, yeah. Larry Hama? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say God Storm. Do you think God Storm, Justin? Uh, uh, the cold angel rain. That was the original November rain. <laughs> yeah, right? like uh, the angel rain. Ooh, beautiful. Thank you. Don't encourage angel rain. Don't, that was. A don't voice. encourage them. I'm gonna go with God Storm. You are correct. Yes. All nice. right. I noticed no clues happening. Yeah, no <laughs> clues. Oh, you see what I did there? God Storm, Angel Rain. Okay, anyway, here we go. Yeah, okay. we know. Question yeah, number two. What character is back and getting a giant size X Men special? Is giant it... man, giant size, big man, not... tall guy. I'm gonna say... Big old hands. Is it big old hands? <laughs> Foot Eliza Dushku. Stop. I'm going to give yeah? you the options and then you oh, select. Oh, okay. We don't know how this works. This is our oh, first man. time doing Dude, this. Okay, yeah. so it's either A, Pike. B, Thunderbird, or C, J. Scott Pike? <laughs> Pike? Yep. Why is Pike in it twice? I'm going to go ahead and say it's, it's a different non-Pike Pike. Pike answer. Yeah. You're gonna go Thunderbird? With the is yeah. Thunderbird? Thunderbird? Thunderbird is correct. All wow. right. How did two Pikes sneak into this? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Last one. What new Batman title is dropping May 24th? Is Batman, it? Batman, no, Batman, no, no, Detective no, Batman. Would you please the Batman's stop. on the sky. No, no, would you please stop? That, a story no, about going, the Bat Signal. We find out how it's plugged in. Got, it's how a a Eliza Douche Comics. Oh my god. Ooh, I love that. I don't Thank like you. this bit, and I can't wait for it to be over. Okay, here we go. Is it oh. A Batman Fortress? B Batman Faso or C Franco Baso? So it's either it's Batman A, Faso? <laughs> Face O? Like O face? Face dash O, yeah. Batman. I'm going to go with the first one. I'm going to go with Neil's answer from the comments. Batman queso. <laughs> Batman has a night at home, and Alfred and he make a sweet cheese dip. May 24th, <laughs> check out Batman Fortress. Wow. Uh, Incredible. Fun. Uh, well, great news. I think we won, so we are going to donate to this abortion fund. Again, it's secure.actblue.com slash donate slash fund abortion now. Uh, and like Justin said, it's a good way to, it's not going to solve everything, but at least it's going to help some local abortion funds. Yeah. If you're feeling um, at a loss for what to do, as I was doom scrolling through Twitter over and over again and occasionally crying at stuff, um, this is a way to feel like you've um, actually accomplished something. Just yes. the way I felt after I pitched that Batman bat signal story where we finally get the story of the light bulbs. Oh, man. And where, untold... does, where does Commissioner Gordon get those enormous light bulbs, you know? Oh. At the and what, like the story. electric bills high? Are they having, are they offsetting their in case, carbon? In like case you guys were wondering about the third answers to the question, uh, it's the uh, 1988 comedy Death to the Pee Wee Squad. And who is this a tribute to? Neil Adams. Neil Adams. Neil Adams. Okay. That's why there was a lot of Batman stuff. 
Gotcha. Okay, great. Shouts. Good stuff. As we all know, as we all know, comic books come out all the time. A bunch of them are coming out this week. Pete, what are you looking forward to? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm looking forward to Giant Size X Men Thunderbird number one. Uh, mm-hmm. I haven't been uh, enjoying X Men, but this one I enjoyed very much, as well as uh, Flashpoint number one. Uh, Flashpoint really? Beyond Pete. number yeah, one. Yeah, interesting. That's right. I, I'm surprised to hear you say that, Pete. That's right. Um, that's right. You can't, um, you can't put I mean, me in a box, dude. I like different things. Yeah, I would never keep you in a box. I would put you in a box, but I don't think you'd stay. That's right. Um, I'm going to give it up for, I mean, a couple things. Um, uh, Batman Killing Time number three uh, by Tom mm. King is wow. super As soon as fun. you said that, Stray Bullet typed that in. It was kind of creepy. I, I Big reveal, I'm Stray Bullet. What? Uh, pretty crazy, right? And I want to also throw it out to Frontiersman Lockup Special Number One, Whoa. Uh, a book from Image Comics. We had, um, uh, I think, Patrick Kindlin, the writer on mm-hmm. our show a while back. Um, and this is, I feel like this is a great thing going on in Image right now is um, some titles that are really not just doing a, a one off story, they're doing like a full universe of things that are happening. But it really gets into real issues that they w- want to talk about in this. Um, Frontiersman is about um, an, a sort of hero who um, uh, got old. The whole all the Justice League type heroes got older. And um, in a recent issue, he killed the villain that was attacking him. And this is about sort of the repercussions of that. And then it gets into a whole additional superhero sort of sci-fi story that happens as a result and the justice issues surrounding that it was a great read i did not um uh i didn't know i was going to enjoy it until after i read it uh i'll give a shout out to twig number one from image comics this is oh a yeah by scotty young and Come scotty on. young has been great creating call. some really interesting on, very man. weird fascinating stuff yeah. so Excited to check that out. However, it is, I guess we'll see. And all of these titles are going to be in the Stack Podcast. What? What are the odds? I know that comes out every Wednesday at 9 a.m., both in the Comic Book Club feed and its own dedicated Stack feed. And, folks, that is it for this week's show. I want to thank all of our amazing guests for being on the show. Thank you to Neil Clyde and Andrea Moody. Check out The Panic. From Comixology Originals, that is up now. Also, Vito Del Sante and Dean Hashbill for The Fox. Family Values, also from Vito. Check out Stray from Dean Hashbill. Check out The Red Hook, PTSD, and Good. Billy Dogma in the Image Comics 30th Anniversary Anthology that is going oh, out right now. Great, great guests week. on the show. Great books from all of them. Please check out all of those ones we talked about. Absolutely. Next week on the show, Ibrahim Mustafa is going to be here to talk about his new book, Retroactive. Also, Serena Sanchez is going to be here to talk about Black Rhapsody. A couple of other podcasts to plug from us. The Doom Room, our Doom Patrol podcast is live. Doom Room! New episodes every single week. And also, if you want all 34 episodes, you can get them right now on our Patreon. Riverdale After Dark, our Riverdale podcast is weekly. After that show airs on Sundays, Marvel Vision, our Marvel podcast is He's going to be talking about the Moon Knight finale tomorrow, as well as many other things coming up. We'll be back very soon with that. Patreon.com slash Comic Book Club to support this show and all the shows we do. Apple Podcasts, Android, Spotify, Stitcher, or the app of your choice. To subscribe, listen, and follow at Comic Book Live on Twitter, Comic Book Club Live on Instagram, Comic Book Club Live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, good night. Good night, folks. Take care of yourself. Feed your cats.